Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Berwyn, Leighton, Paisner and to the second of our financial crime webinars. In this week's uh, webinar, I was going to say show, but webinar, uh, I'll be talking through the market abuse regulation which is coming into effect from the 3rd of July this year. So Brexit or not a week today, we will be dealing with the market abuse regulation. And first of all, I'm just going to talk through the scope of the regulation as it will apply from the 3rd of July. So the current uh, market abuse regime, which operates in the UK, derived from the market abuse directive. And we had across the EU different market abuse regimes which applied in different member states. And following the crisis, there was perhaps the feeling that the market abuse regimes didn't properly respond to the behaviours that we saw through the crisis. So in particular, the benchmark manipulation investigations and inquiries didn't look at the market abuse regimes, weren't found on, found on the basis of the market abuse regimes. And that's, uh, that was criticised by regulators following the crisis. And there was the feeling that, in fact, we had to have a much broader market abuse regime, which would effectively cover a far wider range of instruments that were being traded. And there was the feeling that the market abuse directive hadn't really kept pace with the way in which markets were operating, and in particular that markets had become much more fragmented. So in the UK, we have 13 regulated markets and financial instruments which were traded on those regulated markets fell within the scope of the regime. So that could be uh, shares listed on the LSE, futures contracts traded on ICE, and financial instruments which were priced by reference to those products, so-called related investments, also fell within the scope of the regime. But the reality is that markets operate in a much more complicated way, uh, securities aren't only traded on so-called regulated markets. And we have a lot of securities now traded on MTF, so-called multilateral trading facilities. And the most significant thing, uh, in my view, as part of the new market abuse regime, is that the scope of the regime will extend significantly. So the 70, over 70 MTFs which operate in the UK will fall within the scope of the regime. And significantly, when MIFID II comes into effect, then MIFID II will formally recognise this concept of the organised trading facility, and we'll have a lot of currently OTC traded products, which will fall effectively within the scope of what constitutes an organised trading facility. And so the idea is that when that happens, then we will have a market abuse regime which applies across the board to many products, virtually all products traded in our financial markets. When we're looking at the scope of the market abuse regulation, we're going to be dealing with the same two concepts which we've been dealing with under the existing market abuse directive implemented into the, into the UK through 118 FISMA. So these two fundamental pillars consist of First, information, so the idea that everyone accessing our financial markets should be trading on the basis of the same information. That there shouldn't be a certain group of people who have privileged access to a certain type of information, so-called inside information, because if people are trading on the basis of inside information, then that means that our markets uh, risk being distorted and there isn't integrity in our markets. And similarly, the second pillar of the market abuse regime deals with price manipulation. So the idea that everyone having access to our markets should uh, not suffer from people trying to move prices up or down, uh, but there should be uh, a fair and, and accurate pricing. So those two principles remain uh, in play. And I'll come on to discuss how those two principles will be tweaked as part of the new regulation. But just to flag before we move on, um, 
areas of particular focus under the regulation concern these four areas that I've just put up on the next slide. So the first concerns commodity markets. Commodity markets are much more squarely in focus through the market abuse regulation. So that operates first through the inside information definition. So where market participants have information relating to physical markets, which could be published through uh, a, a normal mechanism through which information is published in, in a commodity market, whatever that may, might be, then information ahead of that announcement could constitute inside information. And secondly, any physical transactions in commodities, which could be used to price financial instruments, i.e. those instruments that we've just been talking about in relation to regulated markets, MTFs and OTFs, uh, will be captured within the scope of the new regime. I'll come on to discuss when we talk about market manipulation benchmarks, but I, it, it is very significant that the abuse of benchmark rates, any benchmarks which are used to price financial instruments, which we've been talking about as part of this uh, new regime, uh, will become a civil market abuse offence. And that is very significant because a lot of the benchmark manipulation uh, examples and issues that we saw through the crisis, if they were to happen now, would be tackled through the civil offence of market abuse in relation to benchmark manipulation. When MIFID II comes, comes into play, then emission allowances will become a financial instrument. So just to flag that um, if you trade in relation to emission allowances, then they will fall within the scope of the market abuse regime. And finally, orders will uh, fall within the scope of the regime. So that means that if you are seeking to manipulate the market in connection with orders that you put on, not only transactions, then that will fall within the scope of the regime. So just before we move on to uh, talk about inside information, it'd be good to just conduct a quick poll and you'll see on your screen a poll which should pop up uh, now. So if you click on the polling question, um, the question that I'm just posing is that in 2015, the FCA received over 1,800 suspicious transaction reports. So they are transaction reports where firms thought that there was suspicious conduct, either in relation to inside information offences or in relation to market manipulation offences. And I'd just be interested in your views on whether or not you think that the percentage of those suspicious transaction reports, what percentage related to inside information? Was it less than 30% between 30% and 50%, 50% and 80% or 80% and above? So please cast your votes and then we will just discuss the result quickly. Okay, well, um, there's, uh, there's quite, a good, quite a good result there. Um, most people, 43%, think that the, it's just dropped a little bit, but around 40% think that uh, there were between 50% and 80% uh, of suspicious transaction reports related to inside information. This is uh, an interesting point because only 5% thought that it was 80% and above, whereas actually uh, the number was 87% in 2015, which I was quite surprised about. but there were 1,800 or so suspicious transaction reports and 1,600 related to the misuse of information, only 200 or so related to manipulation offences. And I think that really shows that inside information is critical to our uh, market abuse regime. It is um, really at the heart of what the regulators are looking at when they're looking at market abuse. And I guess to a degree, that's because it's relatively easy for a regulator to spot if there has been an inside information offence because the FCA has uh, sophisticated software. It can identify unusual transactions ahead of market announcements. So, for example, if someone who usually uh, has been trading in one particular direction ahead of an announcement changes the direction in which they are um, trading, uh, then the FCA can launch an inquiry and uh, it can relatively easily identify the manipulation of inside information. 
So what are we going to be dealing with under the new uh, regulation? Well, the words on the page are quite similar to the ones that we're used to in section 118. So we deal with, uh, do we have information which is precise, which is non-public, which relates to issuers or to financial instruments? And does the information have a, or is it likely to have a significant effect on price? And we know that through our regime, we decide when looking at whether or not information has a significant effect on price, is that information which a reasonable investor would be likely to use as part of his or her investment decisions. And in the UK, the FCA has interpreted these words in a particular way. So we know that precise means, uh, is there information about an event which is more likely to happen than not? Uh, is there a more than fanciful chance of this particular event happening or not? And is this information likely to have an impact on price? It doesn't matter if you don't know if the price is going to go up or down, but is there or could there be an impact on price? And if so, then under our FCA cases, we know that that information would tick the precise box. Uh, does it relate to issuers? If it were made public, would it be likely to have a significant effect on price? So we'll be dealing with the same test. Uh, so the regulation says that when you're looking at whether or not precise information is likely to have a significant effect on price or not, you think to yourself, would a reasonable investor be likely to use that information when they're deciding whether or not to place a trade? And I think we're going to be dealing with the same problems that we've had already in interpreting these words under our existing 118 regime, because it might be that a reasonable investor would be likely to use information which does not have a significant effect on price. And so we're going to be dealing with the same tensions that we have at the moment in terms of interpreting these um, tests, these meanings. And we know that the FCA, uh, when it's examining what has a significant effect on price, uh, thinks to itself, does this information, would this information be likely to have a non-trivial effect on price? And I, I think the real risk when we're looking at these new, uh, these same words, but in a new context under the regulation, is that potentially the FCA might take a different view in terms of how these tests are to be interpreted, because there must be some consistency in terms of how the, this test is interpreted by the FCA, uh, just in the same way that CONSOB in Italy or AMF in France interprets these same words, because we're dealing with a regulation which is directly effective across the EU, and therefore there should be some consistency in terms of how these terms are interpreted. So what are the inside information offences? Well, we're used uh, at the moment under 118 to the dealing offence. If you deal on the basis of inside information, that is a market abuse offence. Uh, under the new regime, if you cancel or you amend an order, that will constitute a market abuse offence. Um, or if you recommend to another person uh, that they should engage in insider dealing, then that will constitute a market abuse offence. So they're two effectively new offences, which is part of the part of the inside information offence. Uh, similarly, under the new regime, there will still be the market abuse offence of unlawfully disclosing inside information. So if you uh, are part of an issuer and you have material information, which is likely to be inside information, and you discuss that outside the course of your normal uh, employment, then that would be a market abuse offence. It's important to bear in mind that under the regulation there are legitimate behaviours around the way in which inside information can be disclosed into the market. So legitimate behaviour would mean that if you are a uh, financial uh, institution and you have some inside information around a, an issuer, if that information is held behind an information barrier and properly protected and secured, then there will not be the presumption that a firm then putting on a trade in relation to uh, a financial instrument in that same issuer would be trading on the basis of that information. And that's quite an important distinction because of a European case, Spectre Photo, there was a rebuttable presumption that where a firm 
had in inside information, there was the presumption that that firm was trading on the basis of that information. Um, and that rebuttable presumption will effectively go under this new uh, regime. So just moving on to one important area concerning how uh, inside information can be disclosed into the market. The regulation recognises that there are certain, certain circumstances in which it's appropriate for inside information to be shared into the market. So you could be an issuer conducting a secondary uh, issuance of shares into the market and you might want to have your advisor go out into the market and work out uh, is there going to be any appetite for this secondary offering of shares and if so what size should the secondary offering be in um, and what should the price be of, of the offering and the regulation recognizes that that is a completely legitimate use of inside information but uh, importantly the regulation sets out very clear and stringent criteria around market soundings so the ability of participants market participants to go out into the market and to share that inside information and so where you have inside information and you want to wall cross someone and to get information from them about how for example your secondary issuing issuance might be perceived into the market you need to make a written record of your decision to disclose the inside information and then when you're about to wall cross someone you need to have their consent that they are happy to receive the inside information many people won't want to receive inside information because they won't want to be prohibited from trading in the securities that you're about to talk to them about um, where you're going to give inside information you need to give the person you're giving the information to uh, you need to warn them that they are prohibited from using that inside information and they're obliged to keep that inside information confidential. You need to produce a detailed note of the information that you've provided to the person you've walled cost, and ideally have that, that person sign the note so that there is a record in relation to the inside information which has been passed over. And of course, the regulator wants to have this information so that if there is a suspicion of trades being conducted on the basis of inside information then it'll be quite easy for the regulator to come along to a market participant to an issuer to an authorized firm and to ask them for details of their records uh, and of their market soundings and so it'll be much easier for regulators to conduct inquiries one significant aspect of this regime is that when market soundings are made then people receiving the inside information should be told when it's likely that that information will be cleansed. And then when the inside information has ceased to be inside information, so for example, the inside information could refer to a new transaction which a company is considering uh, undertaking, and where that transaction is then announced publicly into the market, um, one might take the view that that inside information has been cleansed. And it's important to be mindful that there's a tension between the primary regulation, which says that where inside information has been cleansed, then the person who has gone out into the market and provided that inside information should go to the people that they have wall crossed and shall let them know that that information has ceased to be inside information. Uh, ESMA has issued guidance uh, which indicates that the person who's disclosed the inside information only should rather than shall. Uh, go and cleanse that information and it's indicated that where the announcement contains only the inside information which has been passed to someone who's been wall crossed then potentially that might be sufficient to have cleansed that person uh, but ESMA says that firms need to go back and to check effectively what information was passed as part of the sounding and if there's any inside information out there which hasn't been cleansed through the announcement, then the firm needs to go back and to effectively cleanse the person who's been wall crossed. And I think that's, that's all fine and good where transactions happen uh, and where they are successful. I think the difficulty will come where firms have decided that actually they're not going to go ahead, where issuers have decided they're not going to go ahead with a particular transaction. And the fact that that transaction is a potentially failed transaction might in itself be inside information. 
And so the handling of the cleansing around that information is likely to be an area of particular um, difficulty. I'd be really interested uh, in your views, and we're just going to conduct another poll now, just on how far um, the work has got within your firms on updating compliance manuals for Mars. I'd be really interested to know if you, you've completed all of your work in relation to updating manuals, if it's still a work in progress, or if uh, firms haven't yet started to update their compliance manuals. So the updating of compliance manuals will cover the new definitions of uh, inside information, uh, will cover market soundings and uh, behaviours in relation to um, this slide that we're going to come on to discuss shortly. So I'll just give you a moment to um, tap in with your polling data. Well, 25% of you have completed your work. It's just gone down to 23% um, in relation to updating your manuals. Uh, most people, over 50%, still have a work in progress. Um, around 28% haven't yet started. We're working with several firms at the moment, updating their compliance manuals, helping them with training, helping them with, work out, wor with working out what sorts of surveillance they need to be doing in relation to market abuse. Um, and so probably the majority uh, of people on, on the line who are still uh, having, still working on their, uh, updating their compliance manuals and preparing for mark um, kind of accords with our own experience that people are still working in relation to this, um, this project, which inevitably is an ongoing piece. The FCA haven't yet um, finished producing all of their information and guidance in relation to how we should be interpreting uh, MAR, uh, which of course is pretty unsatisfactory given um, we're about to hit the go live date for MAR. So uh, in relation to inside information, I've talked about legitimate behaviours around market soundings. I just want to mention briefly insider lists, again as part of this uh, idea that the regulator should have a quite an easy job in terms of trying to work out if there have been inside information offences or breaches. Um, any issuer, th this is really the case at the moment, but effectively the requirements have been bulked up. Um, any issuer will need to ma maintain very detailed insider lists confirming who has had access to inside information, when they got access to inside information, uh, what their national uh, security numbers uh, are, national identification numbers. Um, so there's a lot of information which needs to be maintained. And there are pro forma lists, so it's very important that firms do keep those insider lists very carefully updated. Um, as with the current regime, there is an obligation on firms to push out their inside information quickly into the market. So as soon as possible, issuers should be publishing their inside information. And again, this goes back to the idea that everyone trading and having access to our markets across the EU should be trading on the basis of the same information. There shouldn't be some people with privileged or inside information in relation to certain uh, events that they know about. And so where issuers don't have to disclose their information straight away, they, they can withhold information, but only if the disclosure of the information would be likely to prejudice their legitimate interests. So that could be, for example, where they're thinking about a fresh corporate transaction. They don't want to disclose that into the market because that could knock the transaction over before it's, before it's started. Uh, the second criteria is that then the public mustn't be misled if there's going to be a withholding or a delay in the disclosure of inside information. And thirdly, firms must be able to ensure the confidentiality of that information. And so where there has been a delay and the information is then going to be put out into the market, the FCA needs to be updated and told that there has been a delay and given information as to why there has been a delay. For listed financial institutions, there's a different set of criteria which apply. So the disclosure can be withheld where disclosure would be likely to undermine the financial stability of the issuer uh, or of the financial system and where it's in the public interest to delay that information. 
and again where confidentiality can be assured and also importantly where the FCA has consented to that delay. Just uh, in relation to the criminal regime, uh, we've been talking here about the civil market abuse regime through MAR. I just wanted to flag that the criminal regime set out in section 52 of the Criminal Justice Act 1993 remains in place and is not affected by this new regime. So the, uh, there are still three criminal offences if you deal uh, on the basis of listed securities, if you encourage others to deal or if you disclose inside information, uh, if you're abusing inside information, then those criminal offences still apply. Moving on now to market manipulation, we're still dealing with the same fundamental concepts in relation to the manipulation of markets. Uh, and these, these principles really boil down to two points. Um, are you, through your trading activities, seeking to move a price artificially in the market for illegitimate reasons for your own benefit? Or are you not in fact, uh, through your own trading activities, moving the market, but are you disseminating false information into the market or using deceptive devices uh, as part of your uh, trading activities or to supplement your trading activities? And if you're doing that, then um, the manipulation offences will apply to you. Um, I think a difficulty with the new regime is that uh, we're used to dealing with the code of market conduct set out in the uh, market abuse section of the handbook, also uh, known as MAR, which might be confusing uh, going forward. Uh, that, um, that code of market conduct um, will cease to have the same effect that it has at the moment. It will still remain in place, but in a, a truncated format and will provide some guidance. But fundamentally, we're not going to be having the same examples um, so-called safe harbors, examples of, of acceptable behaviors in relation to market manipulation. And so that means that there will be some further uncertainty in relation to what the FCA and other regulators mean by market manipulation. We do have a delegated regulation, which is a shorter form of regulation, which supplements the main market abuse regulation, which provides examples of the types of behavior that uh, regulators will deem to be manipulative. But fundamentally, there's going to be more uncertainty because we don't know uh, absolutely how regulators are going to be interpreting the new manipulation offences, which are effectively the same as the ones that we've had already in the UK. But the same types of behaviour will be the same. So if you have a dominant position in a particular security, then a regulator can look at that position and consider, are you seeking to manipulate the market through having that uh, large position? A significantly attempted manipulation will fall within the scope of the new regime. That is a departure from what we've had uh, under the market abuse directive. Um, although practically in the, in the UK, we would have said that a lot of attempted types of manipulation would still have fallen within the regime, but nevertheless, attempted manipulation will be um, more at the forefront of the new regime. Um, and the regulators have given examples of attempted manipulation would be where you're trying to manipulate the market, but for whatever reason, you can't manipulate it. Perhaps there's been a technology uh, failure um, or something of that nature. In relation to market manipulation, I do think that a very significant new feature of the market manipulation regime is the manipulation of benchmark rates. So following the crisis, we had a criminal regime which was introduced for the manipulation of LIBOR that was set out in section 91 of the Financial Services Act 2012. And through the Fair and Effective Markets Review last year, um, eight other ben seven other benchmarks were added to that, such as the WMR 4PM fix, some repo rate benchmarks like Sonia, Ronya. So we now have eight uh, benchmarks in the UK, which the FCA regulates and where the manipulation of those rates constitutes a criminal offence. Now what's happened or will happen under the market abuse regulation is that any benchmark which can be used or is used to price a financial instrument that falls in the scope of this regime, so financial instruments 
which are traded on regulated markets or traded on MTFs or OTFs will become a civil market abuse offence. So it's very important that firms as part of preparing for MARF identify what benchmarks are used as part of their businesses and what systems and controls they have in place in order to um, protect and to prevent and mitigate against the risk of the manipulation of those rates. So that is a really important area for firms to be aware of. Um, just to flag that the FCA, as with other regulators, has the right to produce so-called accepted market practices, uh, behaviours which do not constitute market manipulation. The FCA has already had that right, and it hasn't, hasn't produced any accepted market practices. Uh, we don't know of any at the moment, but there might be some accepted market practices which are um, issued. Um, finally, I just wanted to flag in relation to manipulation that the criminal offence of manipulating uh, the market uh, listed securities um, still applies. Uh, and I should say that this criminal offence is very broad indeed. It's broader than the scope of the products which apply under the civil um, market abuse regime. The criminal offence is set out in sections 89 and 90 of the Financial Services Act 2012. So if you create a misleading statement or give a misleading impression to the market in relation to any form of share, private share, public share, any form of debt instrument, that could constitute a criminal offence. I am now going to move on to how firms should conduct surveillance for uh, the potential manipulation of markets and how um, firms who are arranging uh, transactions, executing purchases and sales of listed securities which fall within the scope of this regime, how they should conduct their surveillance. Uh, and this also applies to trading venues uh, as well, or firms who operate trading venues who give access to um, market participants to trade on their MTFs. For example, the most significant um, change in relation to the obligation to file suspicious transaction reports is that the obligation becomes uh, an obligation to file suspicious transaction and order reports. So it applies, so saying at the start, to orders as well as transactions. I just wanted to flag that um, a few weeks ago, the FCA put out a market watch paper and it said, we place a strong an emphasis on identifying weaknesses in regulated firms' controls as we do in pursuing market abuse. And I think that is really a strong message to the market that the FCA is looking to regulated firms who are conducting trades on behalf of their clients to fight the fight against financial crime, to identify potential breaches of this regime. And that is as important to the FCA uh, as it is uh, pursuing market abuse offences themselves. So there's a lot of guidance around um, suspicious transaction and order reporting. There's a delegated regulation which applies specifically to how firms should be conducting suspicious transaction and order reporting. Uh, I don't have time to go into this in detail, but I'd be very happy to follow up with any of you if you have any further questions about, about the new requirements on firms, but effectively um, the obligation to file a suspicious transaction and order report applies where you have a reasonable suspicion. So where you formed a reasonable suspicion, you have to notify without delay. Uh, we've been talking to clients, there's a lot of uncertainty over how surveillance should be uh, carried out. Um, but I think the key thing is that firms need to bear in mind that they need to have uh, adequate surveillance uh, systems so that they can identify potential manipulation or suspicions in relation to transactions which they are arranging or executing. Uh, that is really critical. And the FCA, ESMA, have said that regulators don't want to receive every single internal alert that a system might pick up to show suspected market abuse. Um, the FCA want to have humans involved in, in identifying uh, and following up on these alerts and working out if there is a reasonable suspicion or not. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that the FCA has said that 
uh, separately recently in a market watch letter that uh, it thinks there's little to no defensive reporting of um, suspicions in relation to suspected market abuse and that it, it wants to see more reporting albeit it wants to see high quality good reporting and it thinks that generally the level of reporting across different asset classes is too low. It's very important that firms have robust uh, front office training systems in play, particularly for the uh, so that front office business people understand what can constitute uh, suspicions. Uh, I've just received a question in relation to whether or not there's any guidance on what orders cover. Uh, the answer is that yes, um, there is guidance on that. Uh, the delegated regulation talks about orders covering quotes um, as well as formal orders. And um, we know that it's very difficult for firms at the moment to carry out automated surveillance in relation to quotes. That's largely because firm systems don't have sufficient, sufficiently advanced technologies to identify suspicions in relation to quotes. But a lot of firms are building out their systems um, in order to identify and report and comply with their obligations under MIFID II or pre and post trade reporting obligations. And at the same time, we're aware that firms are looking to build out their systems so that they can report suspicions in relation to quotes and orders. So it's important that firms work with their providers um, in relation to that. Um, okay, I will move on just to talk um, very briefly about other areas uh, that are changing as part of the new market abuse uh, regulation. So for uh, listed companies, um, any managers, so persons discharging managerial responsibilities who are conducting um, transactions in their own securities, they need to notify their companies within three business days and that they, those companies need to make an announcement to the market about any transactions within three business days. Uh, there's a closed period of 30 days prior to an announcement where um, managers should not be conducting any transactions in shares in, in their own companies, apart from in exceptional circumstances. Uh, that is a change at the moment under the model code. There's a 60 day period for the model code and the listing rules that's being amended so that it's consistent with MAR. Um, importantly, there's a cooperation requirement among regulators. Um, I think that is significant. Um, there hasn't been much coverage of, of that requirement, but effectively it means that where we have cross-border enforcement actions, we can expect that it's going to be more likely that we have um, the AMF, CONSOB, CNMV, whoever, looking at activities which take place in the UK. And it's going to be more difficult for the FCA to push back on those other uh, regulators and to say, no, actually, uh, this is our market. So I think that um, it's only really in exceptional circumstances that regulators cannot uh, cooperate effectively with other regulators. And ESMA will be, co be coordinating uh, cross-border cooperation. Just in relation to whistleblowing, uh, authorized firms will need to have their own policies in place so that employees can flag suspected breaches of the market abuse regulation. Uh, competent authorities, the FCA in the UK, other authorities across member states will have to have mechanisms, processes in place whereby people can go to them and identify any suspicions in relation to market abuse. Um, one area of particular consternation is in relation to investment recommendations. So where firms are making recommendations, suggesting investment strategies, firms need to objectively handle uh, the information that, that they have and disclose their own conflicts, disclose their own interests in relation to issuers where they're making investment recommendations. That's a very important area uh, and lots of market participants are really focused on that. Um, just in relation to sanctions, there will be uniformity, or there should be uniformity in relation to the sanctions regime as set out in the regulation. So firms can be fined up to 15, 1, 5 million euros or 15% of their annual turnover for conducting market abuse offences. 
and individuals can be fined up to 5 million euros. Um, finally, I just wanted to flag that there are uh, exemptions, there will remain uh, exemptions for buybacks and stabilizations. So where firms want to buy back their own shares because they're reducing their capital or perhaps they need to fulfill their obligations under convertible debt securities or perhaps where they have share option programs that they need to fulfill, it will be appropriate for firms to buy back uh, shares without risk of market abuse, provided they've uh, announced that. Uh, effectively and, and that the, their behaviour is legitimate. And similarly, where firms are, are putting out secondary placings into the market and need to do some price stabilisation, so buying shares in themselves or trying to manage the price uh, of, of their shares around the secondary placement, that is uh, an acceptable behaviour provided it's done for legitimate reasons. So where do we come out with all of this? Well, I think it's going to be good that we have, um, subject to what happens uh, a week today, a consistent regulation which operates across the EU. Uh, that's easier for firms operating across different offices across the EU if it's effectively one rule book that they are applying. And I think that that will be uh, an upside for firms. We know that, for example, in relation to some activities we've been looking at, the AMF takes a very different view to the FCA of certain types of trading behaviour and those differentials uh, should hopefully disappear when we have the new regulation. I know our experience when we're dealing with enforcement actions, FCA enforcement actions, when the FCA is looking at a suspected breach of a regulation, that we feel that actually we're on a much better playing field in terms of going to the FCA and saying, well, actually, uh, we think that your interpretation of the regulation is wrong. And I think it's right that the FCA should feel a little bit more on the back foot in terms of how they're interpreting the market abuse regulation as they would in relation to interpreting part of their own handbook. And that's because the whole point of this regulation is that it's directly effective and that there should be uniformity, consistency in terms of how that regulation is interpreted. Uh, one downside is that the reality is there is more uncertainty uh, now in relation to the inside information offences. Whilst we've got the same test effectively, we don't have the same uh, knowledge that the FCA is going to be interpreting the words in the same way. We don't know the extent to which the FCA will have to have regard to the way in which other regulators are interpreting uh, the new regulation. Um, and I think that that is, that, is, um, that is a level of uncertainty. So I would be very happy to uh, follow up with anyone who might have any further questions. I appreciate that was quite a whistle-stop tour of the regulation. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening in. Um, if you have any further questions, please do contact uh, a member of our financial regulatory team, or you can contact me. I'd be very happy to answer any questions or um, meet up and come in and discuss with you any particular points about the new regulation. I just wanted to flag that next week we have the last webinar in this current financial crime series. My colleague Kate Ison will be talking about the new corporate offence for failure to prevent tax evasion and what it really means for you. That will be on Tuesday at 9am. So please do tune in to that. Um, I appreciate we have an important football match coming up now. So um, thank you very much for your attention and listening to this uh, discussion. Thanks very much.